Hi, I'm George Dory, and welcome to our Coast to Coast AM YouTube channel. Have fun, tell your friends, and share us with everyone. You can also find us on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, TikTok, and Coast to Coast AM's mobile app. And always remember to log on to our website at coasttocoastam.com for daily articles, the best paranormal information, and all you need to know about your favorite guests. And now you can become a Coast Insider directly through the Coast mobile app. We welcome our international listeners and even offer a free two-week trial. So don't delay. Become an insider today. In the spring of 1997, Victor appeared on Coast to Coast with Art Bell to discuss the alien interrogation video. Victor revealed to Art that the footage was copied from a top secret video originally recorded at Area 51. For fear of having his identity pinpointed, he never specified whether he was an employee at the facility, but he vaguely stated that he had reason to be present at Area 51 on more than one occasion. The video is approximately two minutes and 55 seconds in length. In it, we see a diminutive being that fits the description of that of the gray alien, which is seated at a rectangular table. The subject, which Victor says was brought to Area 51 after its craft was shot down in 1989, is situated behind the end of the table, farthest from where the video is being shot, and is behind a large piece of glass, which Victor described as part of a biocontainment area meant to protect the alleged alien from microbes and viruses. Reflected in the glass is what appears to be two television monitors. The alien's head appears to be covered in bruises, and what appears to be some type of medical monitoring device can be seen on the table in front of the being. A person who Victor claims is a military officer attempting to communicate with the alien telepathically can be seen in the left foreground, or well, the more casually dressed human figure can be alternately be seen uh, entering and leaving the video in the right foreground. The room where the interview is taking place is very dimly lit, so darkness obscures the two and reveals them as nothing more than two shadowy figures. For the same reason, only the creature's head is continuously visible, while brief glimpses of its torso are also shown. About halfway through the video, the alien becomes visibly distressed and appears to be suffering from violent spasms and bouts of choking and gagging. The military officer signals for two medics wearing scrubs and masks to come to the aid of the convulsing alien. The medics shine a flashlight into its facial orifices and one begins to wipe foam away from its mouth. At this point, the video ends. It contains no audio, which Victor says is deliberate to, or it was deliberately removed rather so he could protect the anonymity of those who appear in the video the alien interview footage has been the cause of great speculation it's been widely dismissed as a hoax by some but it has its ardent supporters who insist it's real and further that it is evidence of the existence of a much wider alien interrogation program flash forward about 20 years and a former professional wrestler slash gubernatorial candidate turned investigative journalist decided to try to get to the bottom of the story and determine once and for all if the seemingly fantastical, unbelievable claims of the mysterious figure Victor are true. John Stewart, he'll delve into his investigation, how he managed to verify the identities of several of the individuals in the alien interview video, and why he is convinced. The video is genuine, not a hoax. The alien is real. The alien interrogation program is real. John Stewart has spent more than 20 years researching the authenticity of a VHS tape showing an alleged interrogation of a gray alien who was captured sometime around 1991. He watched the video soon after its release in 1996 and became intrigued by its realistic depiction of the gray alien. Stewart consulted video and animation experts who did not detect any forgery. He received a list of medical and military personnel directly involved in the interrogation and was able to speak with several of the named individuals, uh, family members. He also learned about a disgruntled group of military insiders associated with the infamous S-4 facility at Area 51, who revealed they were behind the leaked video. Stewart concludes, the tape is authentic, 
and was leaked by an insider called Victor. John Stewart, welcome to Coast to Coast AM. How are you? Thank you so much for having me. And uh, the last person to come on Coast to Coast to speak about this film was Victor himself. I don't know if this is a kind of patch the torch moment 30 years later, but it is overwhelming, and I, I am just very proud and honored to be with you and talking with you and discussing this with your listeners. And it's it's a long time coming. This is way overdue for uh, someone to come out and and give us some heads up. What went on with this tape, you know, almost 25 years ago? Okay. You describe in your own words, John, what this roughly three-minute video shows. What do we see? Well, we're seeing some sort of a humanoid creature, um, you know, uh, what would appear to be a gray alien. And that was one of the first things that captivated me about this video was that why is a gray alien brown or terracotta or people call it peanut butter color or tan? Why does this gray alien, which should have almond eyes, right? That's been in the literature, the eyewitnesses, the, the abductees, military personnel from the start of Roswell, almond eyes, almond eyes, and, and this being has round eyes. And right away, just, you know, having a foothold in entertainment, I said to myself, well, as I was watching this on TV in 97, like so many other people, this is a really bad depiction of, of, of a gray alien interview because it's, it's not a gray alien. It's something that we, I've never heard described, and I was pretty current and, and well-read on a gray alien beings from all the stories and documentaries and whatnot. And I said, you know, this can't be this bad of a, of a hoax. Why would you put a gray alien? Again, that just doesn't match the description of one. And so I thought, you're right away, you're dissuading people and, and throwing them off the, the, the fact that this is authentic. Richard, like so many other people that have come to me in the past 20 years about this, the minute I saw it, to me, the hair stood on the back of my neck. It just grabbed me. It didn't have a fake feel. Uh, it didn't have that it was produced. You know, you don't have people in the foreshadow obscuring the camera view at times as we see the two men in the viewing gallery where their shoulders appear. You know, the medics come in wearing short sleeve scrubs instead of biohazard containment suits. If you were staging this, you wouldn't have people in the foreground obstructing the view of the camera. You would have it properly lit. You would want to increase the drama by having people in hazmat suits, but they, and you'll explain why they weren't needed. It doesn't, to you, upon your initial viewing of it, feel like it's staged. Talk to me a little bit about the medical equipment that appears to be on the table in front of this entity. Yeah, that was actually the, the, the thrust of my investigation at the start of COVID when I tell people that I put the pedal to the metal, which was the last five years of my life, and you know, investigating this, and I, you know, I really did the hard, you know, thrust into the breach, so to speak, of the, of the veracity of this video. I started with the, the the monitor, and there's this bizarre physiological monitor. We think again, you know, I I, I want to be honest about everything here. We still know 100% what exactly that device was doing. It is a device. It is uh, obviously electronic. It was a blip. And the blip was green, but it had a white hue to it. It was thicker than what you would see on a physiological monitor or a heart monitor in the hospital, so to speak. And I really thought that this was strange. And the blip went up and down. It did not cross the horizontal path of the screen. It just managed to stay in its place. So it wasn't necessarily measuring a heart rate, in other words. We don't know. Uh, we're, still... were there electrodes attached from the, this device to the entity? We're told that, did it, as bizarre as this sounds, the best guess we have had right now on this, Richard, is that it, it was absorbing a, a vibratory energy from this being. And that is what it was basically trying to translate into an electronic blip and that it didn't need to go horizontally across the screen because it wasn't actually monitoring, for lack of a better word, and the infraction or injection of blood going in and out of the heart. It was measuring an electronic disturbance. So, you know, trying to be a credible researcher and investigator, I found two major companies that back in the late 80s and 90s made 
medical monitoring devices, and that was Space Labs and Hewlett Packard. So I emailed and called both companies. Uh, one, I got a response from Hewlett Packard that said, We've never, you know, I sent them the clip of just the monitor. Hewlett Packard said, We've never seen this. This is not manufactured. We have no idea what this is. I get Space Labs, which is the place that made monitors for NASA. I think a pretty good company to call. That's a good place to start. Yeah. And I get the medical device engineering department and Richard, my right hand to God, I asked for, uh, you know, is there an old crusty guy in the back who's been there forever? The young man on the phone said, oh yeah, one second, I can connect you. I said, I can't believe this is happening. I get this older guy on the phone, you know, a little grumpy, and I tell him what's going on. I tell you know, I send him the clip. He call, he has me call him back in five minutes. He said, kid, I don't know what you're looking at here. He goes, I've never seen anything like this before in my life. I said, wait, you've been with Space Labs doing monitors for 40 years. You've never seen this on a drawing board. You've never heard the conception of this type of medical monitoring device at a trade show amongst talk, uh, you know, amongst all of your colleagues. He said, no, I, I, I have never, ever seen and remember at this point we just think it was a pane of glass with two brackets it's very important here and he said but i'll tell you one thing it could be a one of okay what is a one of and he said well in any kind of scientific application or any you know any situation where there is nothing to help you figure out what you are doing let's just say i give the i would give the example i'm looking for gold in 1890 you know and we create a device that helps us detect gold under the ground. You would create a one-off device to help you do that. And he said, this might be this. And he said, and you said this is from a government facility. I said, yes, it's from an underground government facility shot in 1991. He said, I think that's what this is real. This is what you're looking at, that they made this specifically. He does not see the alien in the video because I cropped the alien out of the video. Why did you do that? Because I didn't did want, did not want to compromise his thought process on what this device could be. If I don't know if that makes sense or not. Sure. It's, it's like if you were trying to test Elvis's DNA and you were you're trying to determine whether he was still alive, you're not going to label the uh, the test tube Elvis's DNA. You just want them, the, the people testing it, to be, you know, uncompromised and totally unbiased. Exactly. Folks, I, you know, this. you are just going to hear the unvarnished stories that happened to me. This is the crux of the whole investigation are these stories, not so much the video. So he said, um, yeah, I, I think you're looking at a one-of, and the government is infamous for making one-of devices. And, and who would make the one-of device? Is Do they have a go-to contractor that would make a one, one-off one device? That's a great question. This is just conjecture, and this is, you know, water cooler talk from military insiders, the voluminous amount of them that have contacted me in the past five years since I've been going on podcasts and in making this public is, yes, there, there actually is departments within these projects and these uh, unacknowledged special access projects where, yes, you have, you know, you have a, uh, uh, you have an R and D division, so to speak, of people and even organizations at time that will take the problem and then create something to solve that problem. If speak. So yes, Richard, there are people designated exactly to do that, and I'm assuming that's what happened down in S4 in, in regards to this, or even somewhere else before where these beans were held, like Los Alamos. Was he able to offer any speculation as to what this, I don't know, let's call it a medical diagnostic or a medical device, what it was measuring? No, he did not. I asked him, I said, look, supposedly this was monitoring a off-planet being. Can I ask you a question, sir? If you had an off-planet being, would you have to create a one-of device to monitor Whatever kind of, and I told him that, that it might have a different lung sac, one organ, instead of just a regular heart, like a human. Would you need to create a one-off device like this? He didn't hang up. He didn't laugh. <laughs> he didn't holler at me. He very, matter of fact, said, oh, that's exactly what I would do because, you know, because it's not a human heart. How do you know what an alien heart or heart, as you said, lung organ would operate? So, yeah, you'd have to make something Special. Yeah, he didn't hang up. He didn't laugh. It's like, this isn't my first rodeo. 
He's a former pro wrestler, former gubernatorial candidate, not named Jesse Ventura. His name is John Stewart. And uh, for the last uh, six years, really, in earnest, he has been investigating the alien interview somewhere below Area 51 in the 1991 it came into the hands of someone identified as Victor, who took it to a film production company, Area 51, The Alien Interview. Victor appeared on this very program in uh, 1997 with the late, great Art Bell. And uh, many people uh, have dismissed it as a, as a hoax, particularly after the, uh, the alien autopsy video came out. It was like, oh, here we go again. So, John, let me get back to the actual entity that despite not having almond shaped eyes and having more of a kind of a brownish or, or tan color is still being described sort of as a gray alien. Did you have the actual alien subjected to analysis for, I don't know, by special effects people to make sure it wasn't just somebody wearing a suit or some sort of animatronic uh, device? That's exactly what I was going to, to tell people next. And something that I really, I think we get, get across before our interview ends, Richard, is that I want people to know that I am probably one of the few ufologist investigators that literally runs towards the skeptics, befriending especially special effects people that do not believe that this is real. I have befriended these people, emails, phone calls, you know, hey, Mr. Stewart, we wish you, you know, Merry Christmas and vice versa, because there's, there's, that is the only way for me to find to find the truth of this video is to embrace all sides of the viewpoint of this video, if that makes sense. So I want people out there again, one last time, I run towards the skeptics. So I start contacting special effects people, and I'm not going to go through a whole litany, but let's just very end, end the, the monitor discussion. I get a hold of a gentleman, Alan Levine, special effects person who is investigator with AARO, nice man, great investigator, could talk, you know, in terms of themes that I can understand. I'm, I'm not too bright. Again, so let's tell your viewers what the skeptics say about the monitor. So Alan Levine goes, yes, oh, you called three PhD fellows, and the experts who are doing their thesis on the history of monitors have never seen it, and Space Labs have never seen it, and Hewlett Packard has never seen it. Alan Levine tells me, do you know why? Because it's not a real device. He said, yeah, it's set dressing. You know, let's put something in there to make it look like it's a medical procedure or something, you know, medically happening with this being. I could have done it with a, two panes of glass, and I would have stuck an LED light and somebody with a servo offset bouncing the light up and down. And, yeah, you, nobody knows about this because it's not a real device. Okay? I mean, that's... Hey, that's Case closed? Good. Case closed, right? Absolutely. And again, I, I want your viewers to walk away and go, hey, this guy gave us all sides, which I hate when people don't do that in documentaries or people like myself. So let me go one step further before we close the monitor. We do experiments with lasers and whatnot, and it doesn't look right. Now I contact Jaime Musan. Uh, he's been in the news with the Nazca mummies. He said, John, when this video came out, I took the video to not five, not 10, 13 thoracic surgeons, emergency room doctors, heart surgeons. He said, John, not one of them, all of them said that the blip, even though it's not a typical monitoring the, the infraction rate of a heart, that this blip looks like it's monitoring a single ventricle organ, heart organ, that is in cardiac distress. He said, all 13 of these doctors said the same thing. Sean David Morton, who recently passed, God, God rest his soul, said he took this to two paramedics who are looking at these monitors constantly. And the one paramedic said the heart monitor was coinciding with the beans coughing in distress. And the paramedic, along with the doctors from Jaime Musan, said, I don't know how someone how you could coordinate that, you know, the, the monitor with the beans coughing. Alan Levine says, well, every time the puppeteer, let's say, move the bean, the guy would press the servo and cause the blip to go up and down, giving you both sides. You know, and I hope your viewers appreciate that. So now I find Bill Mums, who, because we're going to get to the alien now, 
who did the Patterson-Gimlin high-tech frame-by-frame evaluation of the Patterson-Gimlin film for Monster Quest and Nat Geo, National Geographic. I figured if he was good enough for National Geographic, he's probably going to be good enough for John. You went, from you went right to the top, yeah. And my wife is sitting next to me right now, and she'll chuckle at this. I write Bill a sizable check. And my wife gave the, you know gave me the eyes like uh, it's COVID. What are you doing with this very substantial check? And you know I said, hey, look, I'm, this guy is going to analyze the video. It's make or break time. And you know, folks, you know you don't own anything until it costs you, metaphorically or literally. Now I'm into this video into- personally, yeah. monetarily. So Bill Mums comes back um, after about a week and a half. He said, John. We don't have the alien in formaldehyde, you know, in a, in, a, in a container. We don't have the puppet anywhere. It hasn't surfaced in 25 years. I, of course, can't tell you yes or no at this point that I haven't seen in 40 years of animatronics and puppets. He said, John, when you are making a foam or a latex puppet, about 75% of the way of the drying process, you have when that happens. You know, for the past 40 years, every doll, animatronic doll, has creases by the armpits. And he sends me 20 pictures from, like, the 1950s until two days prior to me having the conversation of showing creases in the armpits of every kind of doll you've seen, a puppet, your animatronic creature you've seen on movies. He said, here's the kicker. Your being does not have creases by the armpits. You talk about a guy for 40 years in special effects. He goes, and it's a head scratcher. I can't tell you why that happened. I don't know how this was done where he, the bean does not have creases in the armpits. And that even stopped a lot of the special effects guys in their tracks where they were like kind of falling on their words, you know, trying to explain it too. And so, you know, it was putting basically the cat back amongst the pigeons. Like, uh uh-oh, you know, we've got an expert saying, I I can't conclusively denounce this tape. So at this point, I um, followed a lead and went to Havana, Cuba, and I spoke to a retired representative of the Catholic faith. He's dying of Parkinson's disease, very old man. And I showed him the video, and I'm only bringing this up because he seemed too familiar with what he was looking at. But he looked at me, and he said, if you can prove that this video is real, unless we have a videotape of Jesus with the crucifixion or Moses parting the Red Sea, and he was saying this in broken Spanish, if you can prove this providence and and that this is real, he said, my friend, you are... And he touched my arm. He had a crucifix wrapped up in his in his hand that was shaking. And he said, you hold the greatest historical document in human history. So, you know, this was starting to become a little overwhelming to me, like possibly this could be, you know, you're talking about King Tut's doom. You're talking about something on the level of the Dead Sea Scrolls. I want to ask, can you just back up a little bit and talk a little bit about Victor how this mysterious figure claims he came into possession of this video, just so that we can sort of look at the the providence of it. Victor claims on the documentary in 96, came out in 97, Victor claims that there was a drop in security procedures or security levels to do a wholesale transfer of video or film video to digital storage. You know, he kind of glosses over that. So knowing now, and I don't want to jump forward, but I I guess it's okay, that kind of puts Victor in the photo lab of Area 51. They didn't have photo processing or the, the image processing that we later found out because of a defense intelligence report. That all happened at a what's called the photo lab at Groom Lake. So this is how he claimed that the the film was basically smuggled out, but he dances on it, he fumbles on it, he trips on it. And one of the first things that I said in 97, I'm like, he's lying. Not lying like, you know, complete, you know, utter BS. He is trying 
to not compromise himself. And, and, and right. He's not being deceptive know. about the content in the in the footage. He's being deceptive about how he came into possession of it. Right. And we find out later that you're not taking a paper clip out of S4. You're weighed in the nude going in. Yes, folks, you stand in front of a medical doctor in the nude. <laughs> you're weighed. The contents of what you ate that day are weighed, and you are weighed going out in the nude. You're not sticking a, a thumb drive in the crevice of your buttocks. You're not putting a CD-ROM anywhere. that They don't have the facility for to, to do that. And when I found out that Victor did indeed you know, basically lie in 97, my, that I, I thought, well, I'm going to follow some of my gut instincts because I felt that way back in 97. And we've come to find out that Victor was not the one that removed this from the Groom Lake area. Again, he was he taking heat for somebody else? Was he taking the focus off of somebody else? Uh, of course he was. The, the hero of this, and, and I'm not jumping forward, but the hero of this film is a U.S. Air Force cameraman. He is the perpetrator of all of this, and he did it at the Groom Lake Photo Lab. Now, I would have called this the Area 51 audiovisual department, but no, it was simply, and I'll go into the report, a United States Air Force cameraman, who we have not identified, was the one that made two copies. This was not VHS. Well, Victor doesn't even say what type of format it was shot on. There are people out there that say VHS, and there might have been a VH camera in there um, because we have the aid on the like a handheld Sony cam that attached to something else. We actually got that image through frame by frame analysis. But it was the U.S. Air Force cameraman that made two copies of the 16 millimeter film um, at the Groom Lake Photo Lab and the three minute film partial was, was snuck out. John Stewart is with us. He's investigating the alien interview purportedly recorded in 1991 on a videotape in some underground military facility. It uh, portrays the interrogation of what some are describing as a gray alien. Alien goes into some kind of medical distress. There's been wide speculation about this video since it was basically incorporated into a documentary film back in uh, 1997. The man who supposedly leaked the video, the mysterious figure known only as Victor, appeared on Coast to Coast AM with Art Bell back in 1997. John Stewart has sort of picked up the mantle and really for the last six years has intensified his investigation to try and determine whether this video of an alleged alien interrogation is the real deal. So, John, I want to get into the individuals that are in the video that you attempted to identify. Let's begin there. And, and how did you start that, by the way? I knew that UFO researchers oftentimes when they went public would receive material information, phone calls, letters from people inside these programs. Uh, there's numerous cases of that. So I started to take this investigation onto podcasts, and I went on a pretty popular um, alternative website to radio show. A day before that, all of my read but not deleted emails were swiped off my iPhone on four different email platforms. Oh, yes, this is the crux of the story. So tell the, the, the investigation, I basically, which is just ends at the monitor. You know, I had no other part of my investigation completed. And again, trying to be pithy and... And, and um, so about three weeks after going on this program, I started to get an email from a gentleman. You know, he got some things right. He got some things wrong. I, and you seem very sincere. And I'll never forget this line. He, he, he said he was insider. He knew about this program, not about the tape, about the program. And he said, I'll never forget this line. If I could nudge your investigation, give it a nudge, I will. Did he have a name for the program, John? Yes. The name of this program, unofficially amongst the known, if we were sitting at a cafeteria in, in S4, this is called the Alien 
uh, interrogation retention interrogation and retention program, meaning the the housing of the aliens and re, you know and the interrogation basically, um, which is really a thought projection interview of these of these beings. And I guess I'm not getting forward. And this is under the Majestic Program, which was the name. Folks, take this to the bank. Since 1947, there was the majority 12 that were were picked to disseminate all the alien information and phenomenon and contact. But the overall umbrella program since 1947 was called Majestic. Take that to the bank. The security code that would have to be stamped on corresponding inter-memos and whatnot was MAGIC, M-A-J-I-C, Military Assessment of the Joint Intelligence Committee. Take that to the bank. There was many projects, one of them Zodiac. Zodiac, I was told, was to decipher what the hieroglyphic writings were on some of these craft. This project fell under Project Aquarius. And Project Aquarius, for a layman's definition as I can give it to you, the contact of extraterrestrial and interdimensional, very important, David Grush actually coughed on this and when he was testifying to Congress, uh, interplanetary, interdimensional beings in contact with Earth, and specifically the United States government. Okay, so this individual that reached out to you after you appeared on this uh, radio program via email was confirming all these things to you? Well, this is how he did it. So on my birthday, coincidentally, now I'm a public figure, but I'm not a famous person. You could find my birthday on the Internet if you wanted to. After nine months, Richard, of once a month contact, I get a phone call, unknown, on my cell phone. Check your email. This was on my birthday. And I opened up my email, and one of the emails was from the horse's mouth. And I I fumble on this, so let me be very specific. He sent me an email that he received from somebody in the Defense Intelligence Agency, which we have learned really runs the extraterrestrial program in conjunction with the Department of Naval Intelligence and the CIA. But the DIA runs it out at Papoose Lake, uh, south of Area 51. He sent, he forwarded me an email that was sent to him by someone in the Defense Intelligence Agency. Again, I did not look at an actual classified memo. It was retyped, if I'm explaining right. this correctly. Got it. Yes. Probably to avoid me getting in trouble and them getting in trouble. A retyped internal memo of the DIA investigating this theft by Victor and this small cabal. And it wasn't called a theft, Richard. It was weird. It was, it said, an un, it was an, they classified it as an unauthorized viewing, meaning like the public viewed this, this and it was unauthorized, unauthorized release. Right. And let me just really quickly go over the, the internal investigation that was retranscribed and then sent to me. Um, Victor was not correct. This the film that you are that you are seeing was uh, April twenty second, nineteen ninety one, three fifteen in the afternoon. The Department of Naval Intelligence was conducting this segment of the interview. I find out that when they do this once a month with a bean, there is like a conga line outside the interview suite of different three letter agencies ready to go in to insert their set of questions. As bizarre as that sounds, uh, the DNI was the last agency to get its uh, questions inserted to it, to the being. Right. It's also confirmation the DNI exists, right? Because for so long we've been told it doesn't exist. Exactly. I can't do any more than what I've done as far as confirming it. So the memo says that this gray being was an other gray, a haploid. Later find out a haploid is a biological being that only has one sexual chromosome. Human beings are diploid. Call it another gray. From the Tau Ceti star system or the, or the Tau Ceti planet in the star system reticulum. I've looked and that bears out. And then it says how the film was smuggled out. Because I always said, Victor is lying. There is no way you're taking anything from S4. And it was like the movie, I think it's called Ocean's Eleven, where the money was let out of the casino by a Brinks truck. It simply yes. said, when the interview concluded, a United States Air Force police officer escorted the United States Air Force cameraman from S2 Alpha, not S4, 
Okay. From S2 Alpha back to the Area 51, to the, the Groom Lake Photo Lab, which would be in Area 51. Three days later, a digital overlay graphics was added to the film. That's the DNI slash 27. And, Richard, we have to get to 27 before our interview's over. That is the bombshell. Three days later, two copies were made. The second copy was three minutes long. This is what was smuggled out of Area 51, actually Area 51, not Papoose Lake. People think, oh, well, that's, you can't get anything out of Area 51. Richard, I've interviewed a multitude of people that worked at Area 51, from truck drivers to people that for Lockheed that did radar application. The security in Area 51 is U.S. Air Force personnel. You, many times you've known these people f- for a long time. Some days they checked your purse. Some days they didn't. Some days they made you empty your pockets on the way in. They didn't make you do it on the way out. And this has been verified by a multitude of people. And it was, this was how the film was actually taken off the base. And it had said it specifically in the DIA report that the film was put in a GSA burn bag. I don't even know what GSA was at the time. It's Government Services Administration. They do everything from everything a lot for the government, maintenance, uh, they auction cars off it for, you know, drug seizures. I mean, they do a multitude of... I mean, the detail here is incredible. Incredible. Absolutely incredible. My hand was shaking. I was in a Oasis parking lot in the Chicago area. We have, like, gas stations off the highway, and my hand was shaking. And so the GSA burn bag, that's how it was removed off of Area 51, then later collected. After... It gave the name of a person that said this person helped Victor sell this ta- this film to a third party, obviously Rocket. And then it says, after the Rocket production, that Victor gave the footage and a dossier, a packet of autopsy photos and memos and reports that said that on the cover said the United States government's uh, um, investigation into extraterrestrial life. This was all handed, believe it or not, to a very familiar person, Wendell Stevens. And Wendell Stevens died before I found out this information. And we later find out that the FBI raided Bob Dean's bank vault in Paradise Valley, Arizona, because they thought Wendell Stevens had given the the three-minute film to Bob Dean, and he put it in his bank vault. I FOIA'd the FBI. They never said that the raid didn't happen. They just said they couldn't give me any information about this because I wasn't Bob Dean. Okay, Wendell Stevens, uh, as in retired U.S. Air Force pilot turned UFO investigator, Wendell Stevens. Yes. Right. Okay. Just want to make sure people know uh, who we're talking about. Seem to be this go-to guy for this disgruntled cabal down at S four. That's another conversation. Why did Victor take this to Rocket Films of of all places, not to the New York Times? Great question. Well, I took it to the New York Times, and I'll get into that. But so Victor um, waits five years until he is retired. Waits five years, brings the tape. He goes to Fox Studios. I have the executive who took the meeting at Fox with Victor. And Victor tells us on our bell and, uh, that Fox could not guarantee his security and anonymity. And they kind of gave him the bum's rush. And you could tell this in, in Victor's inflection that he was humiliated, basically. He walks out of Fox. He goes over to a newsstand on, it's called Capanga Boulevard, right across from Fox Studios. He opens up a variety magazine. And he sees the uh, like a Chevy Chase Rodney Dangerfield golf funny comedic VHS tape for sale by Rocket Pictures in Beverly Hills. He calls up Rocket Pictures, figuring maybe a second tier, you know, video production company could guarantee my my anonymity, and they would take me more seriously than what Fox uh, Studios did. And Jeff Broadstreet of Rocket Pictures, you know, here gets this phone call, says, "Yeah, come on in." And Jeff Broadstreet tells me the story that Victor did not drive at the time, took a taxi cab to the studio. He appeared off-grid. Jeff used those kind of words. He produced a tattered Social Security card to prove his identity. They watched the film. They brought in Sean Morton to look at the film. Two, three months later, Victor appears on camera, and they start the production and the documentary. This is how as weird of a story as the the film is, this is the provenance of how Victor arrived at the offices. And let me just quickly say, 
Tom Coleman, who I've spoken with for the past three years, and Jeff Broadstreet, who I've emailed and had deals with the past three years, have both said and are emphatic, we did not make that film. And I hear from a military intelligence person, oh, there's one thing I remember, that director of that documentary, he did a two-week deep dive on proving or finding out who Victor really was. And I ask people, if Victor was an actor, as everyone tells me, oh, it's, it's a puppet alien, Victor was an actor reading his script. If Victor was an actor, folks, why would the director of this video production spend two weeks vetting him? I mean, if, you, if it's an actor, you right. hired him from central casting or a casting agency. Why are you investigating an alleged actor if you know he's an actor to to make sure that you know he did work for the government. I found that very interesting. So this is how Victor ended up at, at the Rocket Pictures and how this videotape was eventually uh, produced and came out. I want to get to the personnel that you were able to track down their identities, either them uh, personally or their uh, family members. But let's get to this before we forget. And that is what was there was an overlay on the copy of the uh, the video at the i guess at the bottom it's um it's a code dni we can assume is department of naval intelligence right then there's the number 27 what's the significance can i just take 3 seconds i just got an email from somebody that works for Hewlett Packard's spin-off company yes. telling me that it's very possible i'm quoting the device it was made by Hewlett Packard we made one-off production runs for the DOD. It was not common, and it was not commonly advertised to known or known to other members of the organization. So I don't know if this ever happened on Coast to Coast where someone, someone is helping out the investigator. But I, like I tell That's you, the power of Coast to Coast. This pa platform is huge. Oh you never God. know who's God listening. Bless you, yeah. Mark, with the C. Thank you so much for that email. Okay. First of all, oh, before um, we do that, uh, there may be others listening, and they. Uh, what is your email? Yes, it's uh, it, it, it's uh, got a weird spelling. It's John Allen Stewart at AOL dot com, but it's spelled J O N without the H. My middle name Allen A L A N, and my last name Stewart, like the comedian John Stewart S T E W A R T. And I'm an old guy, so I still use AOL. So at AOL dot com, and um, please anyone that's ever if you, you know if you have any uh, any further information for me. Um, it's greatly appreciated, and, and lo and behold, I just got an email today right now, so it was great. Thank you, Mark. I appreciate it. Okay, um, so um, the DNI, DNI Depart 27. Department of Naval Intelligence. So, you're ho Richard, you and I are hoaxing a video. Why would you and I put a an, an acronym of a, of a military division that can't be proved, that doesn't exist? Even back in 96, there were still the yellow pages and the white pages, and the Internet started to come to fruition. Even to this day, you, there's no reference for the Department of Naval Intelligence. That's what Victor says the DNI stood for. I, you know, happened to run into a naval aviator who was a teacher, and I sent him a text. He had no idea what I was doing and working on. I said, Michael, is the Department of Naval Intelligence a real department? He writes back, yes, it is. I said, how do you know this? He said, because they tried to recruit me before I went to Pensacola for Naval Aviator School. He said, yeah, John, it's the spooks for the Office of Naval Investigation or the Department of Navy. It's their, for lack of a better term, it's their CIA covert operatives. It's that for the Office of Naval Intelligence. And I was stupefied. And they said they tried to recruit me before I became a naval aviator. And I said, Michael, why can't I find it? He said, you're never going to find it. They don't have a shingle hanging out of an office building in Georgetown or Washington, D.C. or Virginia. He said, it's an agent. Again, this is critical. It is, he said, it is an agency. So it's allowed to be buried inside the Office of Naval Intelligence and the Department of Navy. He said, you'll never find it. So that's uh, one. Did you get any other corroboration? That's one. Yes. Yes. So I'm in. Uh, so. A person from the Internet sends me a conference pamphlet, an outline of the events at a military conference. I have, the, I have a copy of it. What does the pamphlet say? And Richard so-and-so from the Department of Naval Intelligence is going to present 
so on and so forth. So we have that confirmation along with the aviator. Now I'm in a bo- I'm in a microbrewery. I'm not going to say where because I don't want to divulge him. Owned by a former CIA agent. I, I mean, folks, this is like a, a, a again, it's like a it's like a, a movie script. And I kept catch him off guard. And I said, "Can I ask you a question? Is the Department of Naval Intelligence real?" And I want to be specific here, sir. I'm not talking about the Office of Naval Intelligence. And he's looking down on the ground right now. Remember, music's playing. We've got beer mm-hmm. flowing. But is the Department of Naval Intelligence real? And he looked at me at his hands full. And he goes, "Yeah, yeah, it's real. It's an agency." I said, "Is it true that it's an agency within the Department of Navy?" He said, "Yeah, it is true." Gets up, walks to his office. He owned the owned the microbrewery. I don't see him for ten minutes. <laughs> what is this guy doing? So there is three confirmations. Now the fourth one. I'm doing a bus tour when I ran for Congress. I won't say his name. A former naval aviator that became a U.S. senator that is no longer living. I don't think it's too hard to find out right. I who think that we know, was. Yeah. Before we got back on the bus tour on a campaign stop, I said, Senator, can I ask you a quick question? Because we just took a picture together. What is the Department of Naval Intelligence? Richard, this jolly, happy senator turned to me, snapped his neck, gave me this aggressive look, and he's like, you don't need to know anything about that. Stormed off. Walked on the alternate bus. I didn't see him all weekend. A former CIA person tells me that it's real. A, a, a naval aviator tells me that it's real. I see it in a, in a document. And I'm really proud that I'm, one of, I'm the, I think, the first investigator to prove the provenance of the, of the de- Department of Naval Intelligence. It is a real organization. Okay. Now the 27. The bombshell. Never knew what it was. Victor stumbles over it. It's a jury-rigged cataloging system. Do you think the military is going to do something haphazard as jury-rigging a cataloging system? That Richard, on my soul, that never made sense to me when Victor said it. I'm watching a Linda Moulton Howe documentary where she's talking about the Ronald Reagan briefing on extraterrestrials from 1980. In the documentary, she is showing the briefing papers. They all have 27 on the top of the briefing papers. Remember, folks, a 23-year-old screenwriter allegedly wrote the script to this alleged alien interview hoax. Remember this, in 96. On the top of every page was 27. I call one of my military uh, whistleblowers. What is 27? He said, you mean Yankee White? I'm like, yeah, I'm shaking my head. I'm like, wait, what, what's Yankee White? He said, John, 27 is a security designation, an umbrella security designation called Yankee White. I'm like, okay, unpack that for me. He said, Yankee White is the security designation for anyone who has contact with the President of the United States. And if you and, and if you didn't have any contact with the President of the United States, like you weren't on the Joint Chiefs or you weren't on his cabinet or you never were able to communicate to the President, and you didn't have the Yankee White security designation, you would have to stop watching that film. You would have to put the packet or the briefing papers away because you did not have the security designation, Yankee White, to view that packet. So I'm asking people, forget about about the film, forget about the alien. Would a screenwriter in 1996 know what the hell Yankee White designation was and the security number attached to it, which is 27? And Richard, you'd have to put that on the film. I, I, this is what I was told by military people. So people have to know in the military or intelligence communities what security classification that you're watching. And oftentimes you'll hear somebody say, anybody without a security classification of Q must leave the room. This has been told to me numerous times. So that is why 27 was on that film. And as we get to the men in the room, which I'm going to very briefly go over, one of the men in the room, he's the only name that I have divulged openly because he's dead, was Rear Admiral William Schaefer, nicknamed Ted. He was the chief security liaison to the chief of staff, Colin Powell. He was in the interrogation room. 
was there because Admiral Schaefer was a, lay, uh, was a briefing liaison assistant to Colin Powell inside the Oval Office. I've proven that he's been in the Oval Office, having contact with POTUS, thus the 27 on the film. And if you're going to tell me that a, screen, a 23-year-old screenwriter in 1996 figured that out, then you've got a greater imagination than I do. And so this rear admiral was in the interrogation room with the alien? The retranscribed briefing document that was sent to me put five men on a list. The first person was with Army Intelligence. The second person was this rear admiral, Edward Schieffer, nicknamed Ted. Richard, when I got this list and I Googled Rear Admiral Schaefer, and you see the picture on Wikipedia in his bio, he's with Colin Powell, my hand was shaking. I'm like, this is, I never even heard of this guy. And Linda Moulton Howell, who has seen this list of names, said, quote, you have gold here, John. I said, why? She said, because I've never heard of any of these people. And in ufology, we always see retread names. She said, and some of these men are alive, and all of these men can be searched on Google or Wikipedia. I said, yes. And Linda Moulton Howell was stupefied that, you know, if this was a hoax, if I was being hoaxed by a, a man in his 70s, the man that emailed me for yeah, that you'd pick known names. You would pick people names that everyone knows there's no names of anybody that anybody right. knows so right. the next okay. name let me get into the contact was a naval captain at the time retired a rear admiral but i originally thought i was being hoaxed because when i wikipedia him he was a rear admiral and my one investigator said john this list is from 91 he was probably a captain in 91 and then in 2014 15 retired a rear admiral I'm like if you're not being hoaxed this is legit i emailed him richard he emails me back now i'm not telling him what i'm doing i'm just saying i'm a documentarian working on a military project we're going back and forth in such a jovial he tells me to call me call him his nickname he doesn't wear the uniform anymore anymore we start joking about fried chicken at these Virginia gas stations. I laugh. I'm going to take you golfing one day. We're going to go have fried chicken. This is the interaction of the email, folks. Very important. He said, look, what are you actually making your documentary about? And I give him this long explanation. Don't be mad at me. Just here it is. This was I, I was sent. He ghosts me. Doesn't call me crazy. Again, this is the, this is repetitive. Doesn't call me crazy. Doesn't say I'm in trouble. He ghosts me. And military men who have heard this scenario said, look, an honorable person in the military isn't going to lie to you. They're just not going to talk to you anymore. And that's what he's doing. And I don't know about you, Richard, but in 2022, when you ghost somebody electronically after having that kind of a jovial email interaction, I think that speaks volumes. You're over the target, as they say. I just very quickly, can you tell me about the, the medical personnel? and uh, you identified a f uh, them and, and located a family member? Yes. So many aspects of this investigation where somebody says something 27 years later, that person, that what they said comes true. Victor tells everybody on, on Art Bell and in the, in the documentary, the medical staff are chosen, quote, more for their ability to keep secrets than their medical knowledge. Remember that. One of the doctors is currently practicing in Connecticut, was a pulmonologist in the VA back then. Remember, the being is having a coughing attack, a, a breathing attack. The other person, the other doctor, died in California in 2014. Richard, I tracked down his second wife, his widow, who was his second wife. And I call her up, very quick story. This very, can you imagine telling an 80 year old woman, I, I think your husband was involved with extraterrestrials. Wow. She doesn't laugh at me, doesn't hang up the phone like everyone else. And she said, Richard, Richard, I almost fell off the couch. You know, John, you, you're, you're kind of solving a family secret. I, I'm like, what? She said, yeah, she's like, you know, for years, none of our friends who are all ex-military people, and including myself, could never understand why, and she gave her husband's nickname, why he never spoke about his time in the U.S. Army Medical Corps. Richard, I never told him, told her that was on the report. That was what was on the report. He was in the U.S. Army Medical Corps. So how could she know that? Anyways, she goes, John, my husband never ever, ever spoke about his time in the U.S. Army Medical Corps, and I never figured out why. It was a sore subject. We would fight about it. Our friends who told funny stories about drill sergeants or a story about Vietnam or... Did you show her the video and was she able to identify him?
I sent her the video, 80-year-old woman, YouTube link. I call her back five minutes later. She's like, that's my husband. I'm like, who? She said, on the, be- the alien being's right shoulder, to our left on the film, that's, and she used his nickname, that's my husband. So, folks, wow. I have an 80-year-old woman who fingered her husband, identified her husband by the bridge of his nose and his eyes and his forearms of being the doctor on the alien's right and our left. John Allen Stewart at AOL.com if you want to get a hold of him. Uh, John, thank you so much. Do this again soon. The Coast Mobile app is now available for download on iPhones and Android devices. You can become an insider directly through this app. This is a great option for our international listeners and new users will also receive a free two-week trial.